Yeah. You're here. No, no, you sit there. This is great. What a terrific turnout. Thank you all for being here. And it's uh, my privilege, very briefly, uh, to uh, uh, welcome you and to introduce uh, uh, our Congresswoman uh, for you today. Although I, I, it sounds so trite, but you are indeed a Congressperson that does not need to have an introduction at San Francisco State. For over 25 years, uh, she has uh, represented San Francisco uh, State. Uh, first in the Assembly and uh, in the Senate, and, and now as a representative uh, in, the, uh, in Washington. You fought, Jackie, over the years uh, uh, for uh, so many things that were important uh, for our students and for, uh, for our campus, uh, whether it had to do with financial aid, uh, health care, women's rights. And for that, we thank you. Thank you very much. The forum is particularly uh, timely given the context of Women's History Month, as well as the birthday of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg, mm. which I was delighted to hear, uh, who has been an important defender, of course, of women's rights uh, uh, to medical services. And as a campus that has worked hard over the years to recruit a, divor a diverse faculty, 48% of whom are women, and whose uh, student population now uh, is comprised of 58% women. We are proud to serve as the host today uh, for this gathering. Uh, I should point out that the health insurance coverage that we do offer to all of our employees as well as to our students does in fact include comprehensive contraceptive uh, coverage. <laughs> as been so for 15 years, or at least for 15 years. Uh, so we're. Uh, we're, we're pleased and, and proud of that. Uh, and as the legislators engage in public policy decisions that do in, f in fact affect women's health, it is essential that policymakers and academics engage in mutually productive dialogue and open debate. And San Francisco State has always been an institution whose legacy is inextricably tied to a deep commitment to community and to public engagement. And as such, we offer the recent attempts to, by some, to demonize those who would engage in free and open public dialogue on the issues that are of such concern to us. And we believe that we can have the dialogue without some of the demonization that, is, that has been going on. And so today's forum does, in fact, uh, honor uh, our steadfast uh, commitment to public engagement and to the face and to the exchange of ideas and the thank you uh, that you have provided for us um, uh, as our representative. And I want to uh, uh, express my personal appreciation, but I also, I know, speak for our students and faculty and staff who are here, uh, uh, Jackie, uh, uh, to say thank you and, and welcome to San thank Francisco. You. Well, I always feel very comfortable being here. It is like, like home. And uh, I want to say to the outstanding chancellor, um, all of you I'm sure are aware that this is his um, victory lap on campus. Um, after 24 years as chancellor here, he is retiring uh, this, the end of the school year. And I think you all know that it was under his extraordinary leadership that diversity really became a hallmark of this campus of the uh, state university system and of the 1100 or so faculty that have been hired since he was first appointed 70 73 percent are either uh, minorities or women so um, it's a, a a great hallmark and a, a great tribute to a great leader so thank you dr corrigan So I'm honored that you have all taken the time to come today. Um, we are, are thrilled to have the opportunity to bring you this forum. Um, I will going to give you a little history lesson now. 
I'm going to take you back in time to 1971. It was a watershed moment for the woman's movement. This book, Our Bodies, Our Lives, was published with the notion that women must take care of themselves as it relates to their health from reproductive matters to breast cancer. A short time later, Ms. Magazine uh, appeared as an insert in the New York Magazine. Its pages spoke about a gender gap that most women were likely to be second-class citizens earning less than men with fewer opportunities for advancement based simply on the fact that they were women. More than four million copies of this book, Our Body, Our Lives, has been sold and a new edition was just released last year and Miss Magazine continues to speak to the power of women. So, I'm here today, however, to speak to the young women in this room about the perspective of my generation, starting with this. The roar of 1971, which is, mind you, more than 40 years ago, has been diffused by a relentless counterforce that has produced a gender gulch. As Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm said in a recent article, we have gone back in time to the 50s, the days when people equated contraception, women's health, and Planned Parenthood with abortion. Lawmakers at the state and federal level are passing and proposing legislation that controls women's bodies, has absolutely no basis in science, and is completely derived by ideological beliefs that have no place in our government. We have a Republican presidential candidate claiming that he would, quote, get rid of Planned Parenthood if elected to Congress. Mind you, 97% of the services offered by Planned Parenthood in this country are for screenings of women, whether it's for breast cancer or ovarian cancer or uh, for contraceptive use. Only 3% of what Planned Parenthood does is abortions. And my conservative colleagues in Congress are looking to undermine the advances of President Obama's The Affordable Care Act. Two weeks ago, the Senate narrowly defeated the Blunt Amendment by a vote of 48 to 51, which would have allowed an employer to refuse coverage for birth control or any other health care service if they felt the service conflicted with their religious or moral beliefs. Now that is a staggering concept. That is a concept to suggest that employers literally could pick and choose what services they would offer to their employees and base it on some moral imperative. A companion measure called the Respect for Rights of Conscience Act currently has more than 220 sponsors in the House and in all likelihood will be brought before the House of Representatives sometime in the next couple of weeks. So turning back the clock may be the theme of the Republicans in the House and the Senate. But turning back, turning back the clock is not an option for women in this country. A bill in Arizona passed that state's Judiciary Committee would enable employers to fire women, to fire women for using birth control. Are you hearing me? <laughs> employers could demand proof that women are taking birth control for non-sexual purposes. I mean, if there is not a greater invasion of personal privacy than to have to explore um, why you are using birth control pills with your employer. I don't know what is. So all that being said, many changes have happened since the 1950s, and birth control has helped create the social order we see today. Women outnumber men in colleges and universities. 40% of working wives today make more money 
than their working husbands. And by the year 2030, it will be 50 percent. So there are many changes occurring in our world that would suggest that having control over when you get pregnant and when you have children should be something that is determined, determined privately by the men and women who are making those decisions. It also makes a lot of economic sense to provide birth control for anyone who wants it. And no one in this country should endure scrutiny or humility for taking control over their reproductive health. We're going to have some outstanding experts talk to you uh, today about the cost-benefit associated. Something like a, for every dollar spent on birth control pills, a $4 savings in terms of health care services. So we will have um, many experts talk to you today. The first expert is someone I have known for uh, probably close to 20 years, and she has been the CEO of, uh, and president of Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, the public policy office of the eight independently incorporated California Planned Parenthood Affiliates. Kathy Kinnear has been leading PPAC with some extraordinary records um, to boast about. One of her most significant ones is the creation of Family Pact. It's the nation's largest universal family planning program for low-income women, men, and teens in the country. She also worked um, very closely with me in adopting the Contraceptive Equity Act that provided here in California that if a, an insurer offered a prescription drug benefit, they could not discriminate on one class of drugs, that being contraceptive pills. It was the first of its kind in the country and became a, a benchmark for others uh, to pursue. So Kathy Kinnear, 20 years of outstanding work on behalf of reproductive health for women and families, we welcome you. Well, my job is a lot easier when I have great legislators like Congressman Speer to work with. So thank you all for keeping electing her. because, And I'm so happy, at least in Congress, there are no term limits. So I don't have to worry that we're going to lose her in a, like we did at the State Senate after her service there. But she's, she has been instrumental. It, you probably aren't watching C-SPAN in the wee hours of the night. But you know, at the beginning of this congressional session, after the Republicans took control of the House, one of the first efforts, despite the fact they ran on the jobs and the economy, one of the first things they did was introduce legislation to defund Planned Parenthood. That was their first priority ahead of jobs and the economy. And it took courageous members such as Congressman Speer, you know, valiantly leading the fight um, that we weren't successful in the House. But thank goodness on the Senate side, we were able to defeat the amendment. But the attacks have not stopped. And they keep getting, quite frankly, crazier and crazier. Um, but I want to step back, since it is Women's History Month, and say a little bit about Planned Parenthood. You know, our founder, Margaret Sanger, founded Planned Parenthood at the beginning of the uh, 1900s. And it was illegal at that time, under the Comstock laws, to talk about birth control because it was considered obscenity. And so before Margaret Sanger could talk to women about how to protect themselves and prevent un unintended pregnancies, or unwanted really at that time, given the family size that women had. Um, and so she had to fight that. She had to fight it and even go to jail because of what she believed. But as one person stands up and, and puts a voice to a problem, others will follow. And that is what has happened through the course of history for uh, women, particularly in the United States. We weren't given the right to vote. We had to stand up and fight for the right to vote. We fought this, and we thought we won. And we fought it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1968, Griswold v. Connecticut, which ruled that the, any woman, you didn't have to be married, because prior to that, you had to be married to have contraception. Any woman had a right to have access to contraceptive. And it was um, recognized as a privacy right. It's a private medical decision that only a woman should be able to make. And that became the foundation for the Roe v. Wade decision that later passed the Supreme Court. Um, but here we are. We're talking about if they can't make it illegal, they just want to make it impossible for you to access it. And so that's where we are today. And 
you know, at Planned Parenthood, um, we have been around um, for almost a century. And we've withstood attack after attack after attack. And we have withstood this attack. But I want everyone to know it is, while it sounds like it's an attack on Planned Parenthood, it's an attack on the women and men we serve. It is an attack on you. Because if they take us out, you're next. And so that's what's really important about what's going on in the country, is that they're, they eventually are going to go back to the day where birth control might be legal, but no one's going to have it unless they can pay to have it on their own dime. And so that's where we're at in this debate and in this Congress. And so when we look ahead at um, the future, I see the future in this room right now. And the students on this campus, as you have done before and will need to do again, you will determine what the policies are going to be if you register to vote and if you vote and participate in our democracy. We need every student to register and to vote. It's your rights and your health care. So please stand up, join with Planned Parenthood, join with some of the other organizations you're going to hear from today, and together let's make sure every individual has the ability to make their own reproductive health decisions with themselves, their family, or their doctor. But most of all, not with their elected officials and certainly not with their employer. So go forth and do good, kids. Thanks. All right, Chancellor, you're now going to see some of the best product you've um, uh, created here. Uh, we're now going to hear from three students on uh, their perspectives. We're going to start with um, Ariel Lomack, who is a graduating senior majoring in health education. She is a volunteer for the Peer Health Exchange, doing outreach to area high school students to promote sexual health. She hopes to pursue an MPH degree after graduating this year. Ariel? Hi. Okay, so like she said, my name is Ariel Lomack. I am a student here at San Francisco State, and I'm seeking a degree in health education. I also work with a program entitled the Peer Health Exchange, where I am a health educator within the local school system. Um, within this program, I teach workshops weekly, and the focus of the workshop is rape and sexual assault. I deal with high school students that have been through rape and sexual assault, and sometimes um, I've actually dealt with a student who actually came to me and said that she was a victim of a rape and sexual assault, and she ended up pregnant due to this rape. And she was not on contraception. She can't afford it. I don't even believe, I don't think she even has health insurance. So, you know, that kind of just goes to show the importance of having contraception available and also having the proper education around, you know, sexual health for young teens. Um, I believe that my peers and I need, need contraception available to us first and foremost to protect us from unexpected pregnancies and sometimes unwanted pregnancies. In 2014, I will have graduated with a master's degree in public health and my fate will then depend on whether my employer offers insurance that covers contraception. My plans to work for three years before having a family and all my other dreams will be threatened because I will not be protected. What if the condom breaks and there is no plan B available at my pharmacy to relieve me of the fear of bringing a child into this world unprepared? Also, within, within the community that I'm from, there are high rates of pregnancy, you know, within the minority community, simply because contraception can't be afforded and is not available to them. Fortunately, I have contraception available to me on campus that many others don't have the access to because they have already graduated and are now vulnerable. Many people where I come from end up pregnant and go through abortions. And this has become their method for contraception because regular contraception is either too expensive or unav unavailable entirely. 38 to 50 percent of these pregnancies were unintended pregnancies, and this is mostly found within the urban areas. And difficulty in finding family planning and lack of access to birth control contribute to these high numbers of unintended pregnancies. Among women 
in, in their 20s, me, my peers, 60% of these pregnancies are unplanned and usually among the women of this age group, almost half of their unwanted pregnancies end in an abortion. And it just goes to show that, you know, we don't have the right type of contraception available, you know, to us to, 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 us to protect us from unwanted pregnancies or unexpected pregnancies. And with contraception, we can kind of control this and have other options. Contraception is not only a remedy to preventing pregnancy, it is the most it is the most commonly used method to induce women's menstrual cycle and to help, regu help regulate irregular and heavy flowing cycles. Many women that are on birth control aren't even having sexual intercourse. Instead, they are using it, for, using it for other medical reasons, such as for controlling endometriosis and also to control acne, which is something that many women suffer from. And only 42% of women who use birth control use it for contraception. So we know that birth control has been well established to protect from pregnancy. However, we now know and recognize that birth control is also used for other medical conditions and that it should be readily available to millions of women to rely on it, that rely on it each year. Thank you. Our next student speaker is Brianna Williams, who is a senior majoring in physiology. Uh, who wants to go on to medical school after graduation and she's also a volunteer outreach counselor for the peer educators uh, advocating campus health known as peach and she works at the student health center as well please welcome brianna Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brianna Williams, and like the Congresswoman said, I'm a student here at San Francisco State University, and I am also a peer sexual health educator, a part of the PEACH program here on campus. And I have the privilege every week of peer counseling young men and women uh, who seek information on topics such as sexually transmitted infections, birth control, and safer sex practices. As an individual that tries to encourage women that I see week after week to examine their options, when it comes to their reproductive choices, I can't stress enough the need for access to affordable contraception. Um, I believe that America sets an example for the rest of the world when it comes to important issues such as this. As a nation that reaches out to the world to support others' human rights, there should be a consistency in how we value our own people. Therefore, the way we treat our women should be very important. The ability for women to make comprehensive choice regarding their own reproductive health is a privilege that should not be jeopardized. I see young women on a weekly basis who want to be proactive in their health by learning about and obtaining contraception, but they aren't always aware of their options uh, financially. Many women that I see don't even know about the Family Pact program and how they can receive contraception for free. And it's a service that we offer in the health center. And you don't have to have current health insurance to obtain it either. Uh, there are around 47 million Americans who currently don't have health insurance, and I have to say that I am one of them. But because Family Pact exists, I could have access to contraceptives. And I will say that oftentimes, the women that I see haven't been fully educated regarding their own reproductive anatomy, which I think is imperative to making an informed decision about choosing a birth control method. Consequently, I believe the root of this problem lies in the lack of education surrounding reproductive health. I think SF State is very fortunate to have a very wide variety of human sexuality courses, and I think that I would encourage all of you to take at least one of them before you graduate. When it comes to the subject of health, we place the utmost importance on preventative health care. In the way we want more Americans to eat healthier and exercise to avoid diabetes and obesity, that should be the same top-down model that should be applied in regards to reproductive health. In giving women the power to make these choices, or giving a woman the power to make these choices for herself, she can determine her future. By being able to plan or postpone a pregnancy, it will give her the freedom to advance in her education and in a career. 
But ultimately, having the right to choose when to become pregnant will lead to healthier pregnancies and overall healthier families. Um, I'm tired of having people who aren't really educated on birth control or don't really care about the information from both sides determining the laws that surround reproductive health and turning it into a financial debate, when really this is not a financial debate, it is not a partisan debate, it's a human rights issue. And that's why I believe that access to affordable contraception is important. Thank you. Next, we have Lovejeet Ajala, who is a junior majoring in political science and with an interest in health policy. She, too, is a volunteer with the Peer Educators Advocating Campus Health, PEACH, and she is um, also interested in getting her MPH at UCLA after graduating from San Francisco State. Lovejeet. Hello everyone, good afternoon, thank you for being here. The point that I want to highlight most here is to say that the conversation about contraceptive services in this nation has narrowed our perception of women and health. I think it's very important to realize that while sexuality is a huge part of women's health, we need to open up our minds and be willing to also understand that contraceptives are not solely used to prevent pregnancy. All this time we're spending as a nation focusing so closely on the sex lives of women of this country has prevented us from understanding that this is not a full out conversation about sex. This is a conversation about women's health. It should be a conversation about the woman who has the right to plan when and with whom she wants to have children. And it is also about the woman who has severe monthly menstrual pains and how contraception allows her to go to work in the morning. It allows her to show up to school the next day. It's again about the woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome who has to deal with irregular cycles sometimes 50 days, 60 days cycles, and how contraceptive services help her. I know how hard it is to deal with every single pressure of life, school, work, family, everything. And with women, we're, asking, we're adding another pressure onto them. I know these women. I sit next to them in class. I sit next to them on the bus. I work with them. And by limiting their affordability and accessibility to contraceptives, we're doing an injustice to them. That's the bottom line. To put things into perspective, I just want to say that in private insurances, contraceptives can sometimes cost $50 for one month. And if you're a San Francisco State University student and you've ever been in a large lecture hall class, you know about the iClicker 2. That iClicker, which is used to answer questions, also costs approximately $50. So for that woman who goes to San Francisco State University, who needs those contraceptives and also needs to show up to class, we ask her to make a choice between two necessities. $50 it was, is what it costs to fill up a tank in a 96 Toyota Camry. We ask that woman to choose between showing up to work and dealing with her painful <coughs> menstrual cramps. $50 is what it costs to purchase a humidifier. So we ask the allergy suffering woman too to choose between her sneezing and to choose between her polycystic ovarian syndrome and controlling it. We're asking women to make choices between their health and their job, health and their education, and health and whether they want to eat at night. It's an injustice. Birth control makes women more productive. It allows them to beat those menstrual cramps. And discriminating against them or sending women and c girls that come after my generation the message that their choices are just not important enough, that's a destructive message. We need to empower these women. And instead, we're letting them suffer mentally, physically, and emotionally. You have the right to speak up in this country, and I encourage you to do it. Because if not, let me just say this one more time. We're letting the clock tick backwards. Thank you.
So, Chancellor, aren't you impressed? Absolutely. Uh, okay. All right. Let's give another round of applause to our three student speakers, and you can now exit the stage. All right. As the student uh, experts are are um, leaving the stage, we want to welcome our health experts to come forward now and join us. We're now going to move to our expert panel. And our first expert is um, quite an expert. She is the president-elect of the American Congress for Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, Jeannie Conry is a physician and has been for 23 years at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, she is the assistant physician in chief at the Permanente Medical Group in Sacramento and Roseville. She has been nominated to be president of the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists next year. She's the past chair of ACOG District 9 in California, where she oversaw the Interconception Care Project, a March of Dimes grant to ACOG to improve preconception health care in California. She currently serves as a member of the Select Panel on Preconception Care for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and she's the past chair for the Preconception Health Council of California. Please welcome Dr. Conry. So you can tell it's all about planning, right? <laughs> and I can't say much more than the fabulous speakers that we just had, because really the, the student speakers highlighted everything that we really want to make. This afternoon we're talking about reproductive choices and well women care, and the reproductive choices that we make in order to be able to maintain our health, to maintain the choices in our life. And I really view them as essential health benefits. A couple of months ago, I took care of a woman in the emergency room, 23-year-old student, hadn't had uh, health insurance, and came in having a miscarriage. At the time of the miscarriage, we also found out that she had diabetes. She had not known that. She hadn't been seeing anybody. We took immediate care of the miscarriage and realized her blood sugars were so high that that probably contributed to the pregnancy loss. And if she had conceived and, and carried the pregnancy through, she probably had a five times higher risk of delivering a baby with a birth defect than somebody without any medical problems. So she really didn't have a grasp of what was going on with her own health. Thankfully, we got her plugged into all the things that she needed with education, medications, health choices. And then I saw her for a follow-up um, a couple months later and talked with her about some of her reality choices. And to me, one of the most important things we can do with women is say, what are your reproductive desires at this moment in time? Because I will tell you, choices change, desires change, and goals change. So we as clinicians are obligated, and really to do service to you, need to have that discussion with all women. And for her, the timing wasn't good. She's now got an IUD, and we're working on her overall health. So it's an important choice. I think one of the talks you just heard talked about uh, all the alternatives, uses of birth control. And one of my other patients that I um, saw just on Monday is a 13-year-old who is having heavy menstrual periods, painful periods, and I put her on birth control pills a couple of months ago. She came in a new person. She's very active in soccer and now is able to play soccer. The point I want to make for her is that with all of the things that are happening politically, her embarrassment is that I've got her on a birth control pill rather than calling it a hormone regulation tablet. Mm -hmm. So there are all these hidden things that we don't appreciate out there. The most important thing to realize is that when we're making health care choices, it's about a decision, the woman's needs, 
and her relationship with her health care provider and her partner and what is the most important thing at this time. As Congresswoman Spear said, I'm very involved with a lot of the things going on with women's health in California. And I'm actually embarrassed to say that in California, we now stand up there with a third world country in terms of mothers dying in labor or dying in pregnancy or dying the year after. We've seen that risk triple in the last decade. And why is that? It's because we've seen women who aren't healthy becoming pregnant. We've seen women who don't have access to medical care. In fact, probably 50% of all the pregnancies in California are unplanned, and 50% of the pregnancies require Medi-Cal and often urgent, or urgent Medi-Cal to cover them. So we have women who aren't ready for pregnancy becoming pregnant and not in optimum health. And the end result is women are dying. So if there's one plea that we can make, it's make choices and help us with the help us help you with those choices. If we look at it in a, a broader perspective and we talk about infant mortality, a woman who hasn't planned her pregnancy, those infants have a 10% higher chance of dying than a woman who planned her pregnancy. And a woman who spaces her pregnancy, so the end of one pregnancy and the start of the other, if it's at least a year and a half to two years, that woman has about a 20% risk of having fewer complications just because she spaced her pregnancy. Those are significant changes in the outcomes of our next generation. And getting back to Josie, when I talk with Josie and women like her who have diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease, being able to be on birth control literally makes a difference between life and death. And those are choices that sometimes are out of their control. So we've heard from our students about how important that is to take it back and own it. We've seen changes um, that are unheard of. You know, as, as Congresswoman Spear was saying, you know, I, I go back to when I was in college in the 1970s, and you know, we're talking about constitutional changes to allow women access to birth control. We can hear what Richard Nixon did that he signed legislation about contraception and access to contraception. I mean, that's a generation ago. My daughter doesn't even think about those things, and yet we're having to think about that again. And then my favorite quote is um, President George H.W. Bush saying that family planning makes economic and social sense. So if we've had our previous presidents making those statements why are we addressing changes now that impact everybody's health care? This is something that women have to understand and men have to understand that it's really about your right, reproductive rights. And if there's any choice that we have to make, it's your choice on timing and need and desires. And we have to respect that. Thank you. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce um, someone I've known for over 10 years, um, a, a great friend, a, a great educator, and uh, someone that I think you're truly going to enjoy hearing. Uh, her name is Dr. Nancy Milliken. She is the director of the UCSF National Center of Excellence for Women's Health. She's also vice dean of the USF, UCSF School of Medicine, so all of you um, young students who want to go on to medical school, you might want to befriend her before the day is up. Uh, she's also the, um, was the principal investigator of a proposal that led to the designation of UCSF as one of the six vanguard centers of excellence in women's health, named by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Under her leadership, the center works uh, to enhance research, patient care, education, and leadership activities to improve health and well-being of women and girls uh, throughout diverse communities. And for 10 years, we have worked together on what has been called the Young Women's Health Conference here in San Francisco, where young women in high school are given the opportunity to look at leadership and women's health issues uh, when they are just starting out. So please welcome uh, Dr. Nancy Milliken. Thank you, Jackie. Um, it's great to be here today, and it takes me back uh, to when I was a college student, which was in the early 70s, 
And one of the things uh, that I remember in reflecting on Women's History Month and what we're talking about is the women then called our bodies, our cells book was just being uh, written by women coming together and claiming their right to information and knowledge about their bodies, not feeling that they were getting adequate information and shared decision making from their uh, physicians and healthcare providers, who at that point were predominantly men. And they realized that they had the power not only to read and understand some of the medical literature at the time, but that their own personal experiences were equally valuable in figuring out what were the right choices for women in general and themselves in specific. And that book that Jackie showed you was the outcome of that. It had a profound effect on me and on generations since. Now, Jackie spoke about the five male panel congressional hearing around the issues of contraception and access to contraception recently. At that time, there was a panel uh, a hearing in Congress where they were discussing the information that would be included in the birth control packet that women could have access to. So, you know, that long packet that comes with a lot of information and people were debating what should be put in that for women to understand. It was <coughs> all the people who were testifying were men. And one of whom, as an OBGYN, I'm a little embarrassed to talk about, was a male gynecologist who came in and was arguing against putting all the known information about the pill and its potential side effects in the pamphlet. And he said, and I quote, because if you tell a woman she may have a headache, she'll have a headache. <laughs> so we're just not going to give the information there. That hearing in Congress actually was disrupted by the then Washington Women's Liberation Army to come in and to demand a voice at the table. So I think some of the things have changed, some have not. First of all, we have more women in Congress today, so we're able to have a Nancy Pelosi hearing to get Sandra Fluke in to be, tell her story. And we also have uh, people like uh, Jeannie, who is the president-elect of the American Congress of Obstetrician Gynecologists, so we have the ability to unite with, as people have been saying, the voters, to uh, really make change happen. And I'm proud to be able to vote for both Congresswoman Spear and President-elect Conry to continue that progress forward. I too am not, I, I think that the uh, young women who spoke, the students just earlier, really covered a lot of the ground that I was going to cover in talking about the non-fertility control benefits of contraception, that the availability of contraception is really important to women's health women's well-being and their productivity in their lives, no matter what they are trying to do, whether it's raising children and being a, a good parent, whether it's being in the workforce, whether it's being uh, a, perhaps a caregiver for others, whether it's being working as a volunteer and things, women often need the use of the uh, hormonal contraception to help them for a variety of conditions. And those fall into the areas that people touched on today. Control of disruptive pain that comes along with the menstrual cycle. 
control of diseases that cause pain and sometimes chronic pelvic pain from diseases such as endometriosis help with migraines as associated with the menstrual cycle. Um, things that can really interfere with productivity and the ability to do what one wants in their life and contribute to families and societies. Control of stabilization of the ovaries, so prevention of cysts. Um, cysts that may require surgery, cysts that can rupture and bleed. If that can be problematic for an otherwise healthy woman, it can be particularly problematic for women who have bleeding disorders or other conditions where they may be on a blood thinner, then it can be life-threatening. Somebody spoke about acne this morning and the birth control pill actually helping with acne. Some acne is not controlled by the birth control pill and other options like Accutane, if you're taking it and you get pregnant while you're taking it, there are severe um, consequences for the developing fetus while you're on that. So using birth control in association with that uh, medication allows you to make responsible choices to avoid pregnancy and harm to a developing fetus if you were to get pregnant. Premenstrual sim syndrome or other um, mood disorders that people might have can be impacted by the use of um, hormonal contraception as well and can be a helpful aid. So I think you can begin to see that there are lots and lots of important and valuable uh, ways in which this enhances women's lives. Now, as you get further along in your reproductive cycle and towards the end of your reproductive cycle, women often have conditions that without uh, the use of either the birth control pill or the IUD might require surgery. And generally, those are things with abnormal bleeding. Perhaps it's from fibroids, perhaps it's from some other endometrial problem. And being able to use, women may not even need the medication for birth control. They may have had their tubes tied or something, but they're still using that to avoid needing to have surgery. And then when they get to menopause and through menopause, they don't need it anymore. So it really is uh, enabling women to take care of themselves in a way to avoid risky um, surgeries. And the last thing that I will talk about is when you look at populations that use birth control pills versus populations of women who don't use birth control, we actually see a reduction in cancers, reduction in ovarian cancer and reduction in endometrial cancer. So just looking at health and well-being, there's tremendous value to individual women. There's tremendous value to the people who love them and depend upon them. Uh, there's tremendous value to society um, for the use and availability of these contraceptions. I think that in thinking about that, this is not just a women's issue, it's an issue for women and men because men have the same desires to be responsible formers of families and to have the spacing that was talked about earlier and to enable the people they love to live long and productive lives. So thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Claire Brindis. She is the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies Director at UCSF. 
She is also a director of the Bigsby Center for Global Reproductive Health and executive director of the National Adolescent Health Information and Innovation Center, also at UCSF. Dr. Brindis' research focuses on women's adolescent and child health policy at the state and national level and the evaluations of adolescent pregnancy prevention and reproductive health services for women. Please welcome Dr. Brindis. Thank you, Jackie, and also thank each of you for coming. I first want to just say a big thank you to you for your leadership. Kathy Kinnear talked about how important each of you, one individual, can make such a difference, and you have made this kind of difference in all of our lives. And I just want to say thank you because when Jackie mentioned earlier to you that California was at the forefront of having health insurance coverage for contraceptive care, we now have 28 states that have followed the model of Jackie. So I just really think that she deserves a hand of applause. <laughs> You've heard wonderful experts, both the students as experts, sharing with you their experiences of being uh, counselors and peer educators, and you've heard from two outstanding obstet obstetrician gynecologists. I come into this from a perspective of public health and also from social justice, and I had an opportunity to serve on the Institute of Medicine's committee that was the committee that made the recommendations for the healthcare reform to adopt contraceptive methods without copay. And um, this is the report, it's called Clinical Preventive Services for Women, Closing the Gap. And I want to tell you a little bit about this report and encourage you that if you're interested in this, that you can go online to the Institute of Medicine and download the full report. And having the privilege to serve on this committee um, really was an eye-opener, and particularly because this committee is part, the Institute of Medicine is part of the National Academy of Sciences. It's an independent, nonprofit organization that provides unbiased and authoritative advice to decision makers and the public. So at the request of Congress, the IOM assembled a very diverse group to identify those critical issues and gaps in preventive services for women as to make the recommendations and measures that could really change the lives of women and improve not only their health but also their well-being. And we know that we have uh, recognized the critical role of women but also we need to recognize the critical role of women's health vis-a-vis -vis male health. So the intent of the, our committee was to really look at what are the critical issues that impact women more than men. And obviously, a large part of that has to do with reproductive functions that women still have that men don't have yet. Perhaps at some point in your generations, we will find a way that men can carry the pregnancy to term. <laughs> but for now, many of these issues really do fall on the shoulders of women because of the reproductive uh, organs and the ability to have uh, children. The intent of the health care reform that President Obama as well as Congress passed was to really begin to think about prevention in a very different light than we have in the past. And in all of these debates and in the uh, controversy that you're going to be hearing, especially around the Supreme Court hearings that are taking place in the near future, the presidential election this year, don't lose sight of the fact that the vision for health care reform is how do we re-change, re-shift our focus from a treatment and secondary treatment and care to more of a preventive mode. So using that lens of prevention, we spend some time looking at what is preventive health, what are the measures that have been shown to improve the health of women, and improve and delay, uh, improve health by delaying the onset of illnesses. So we really recognized not only that women are special, but they're consistently more likely to report a wide range of cost-related barriers to receiving or delaying medical tests and treatments or to filling prescriptions for themselves because they often think more about their own family's needs versus their own. A second issue is that many of the current clinical guidelines on preventive services contain gaps when it came to women's needs. 
and we know that women suffer disproportionately rates of chronic disease, disability, for a number of conditions, and that in fact, because of their conditions and the need for preventive care, oftentimes they have to pay more out of their own pockets than men do, and they face higher out-of-pocket costs that prevent them from being able to access the kind of care that they need. And that even moderate co-payments, out-of-pocket costs for preventive services, such as even for mammography and pap smears, deter patients from receiving these services. Now part of the reason why I think that I was chosen to serve on this committee is that I've had the opportunity to, with colleagues at the Bixby Center for Reproductive Health at UCSF, to conduct the evaluation of the Family PAC program that Jackie mentioned Kathy Kinnear was so instrumental in passing. And just to give you a sense about why cost becomes such an important issue, is that when we have conducted the evaluation, we have shown that by providing contraceptive access to low-income women, men, and adolescents in California, we've been able to avert over 300,000 pregnancies per year. Now, wherever you are on the umbrella or the continuum of prevention, in terms of whether you're pro-abortion, anti-abortion, just think about how the upstream uh, prevention of an unintended mistimed pregnancy can really contribute to the decreased need for abortion. So we've calculated that if those 300,000 pregnancies had occurred, we would have had 122,000 additional abortions, 133,000 live births, and the rest a combination of ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages. Just by averting the need for these services by having contraceptive access, free and reduced services, we've been able to avoid um, costs, for example, medical costs, welfare costs, other social service costs for women and children. And so together, related, all of these costs would have been over or close to $2 billion in the first two years after a woman uh, delivered a child and over $4 billion up to when you follow a child up to age five. Jackie mentioned earlier that if you divide that billions into what I call social math, so that's when you take a huge number and divide it down to something that we can understand. So that means that for every dollar that we spend in family planning, the state and the federal government avoids um, over about $4 per dollar invested in family planning. And that by avoiding these unintended pregnancies, we not only save costs, but we also save emotional costs, social costs, psychological costs. I want to come back then to the S um, IOM committee, bridging the fact that that experience having to do with cost avoidance then helped us to shape the recommendations. And while contraceptives have received the greatest attention, I do want to highlight that there were seven other recommendations, one having to do f with free screening for diabetes, for HPV, for counseling on STIs, sexually transmitted infections, for counseling and screening for HIV, for lactation counseling, and equipment to promote breastfeeding for uh, the prevention and detection of domestic violence, as well as annual preventive services. So if you think about women's health, we are now focused so much on contraceptive access, but I think it's very important for us to recognize the role of health insurance and avoidance of costs out of pocket for services such as the ones I've just mentioned. So finally, I just want to say that in terms of our country and in the impact of sexuality in our lives, the ability to plan how many and when in our lives we can have children, if we decide to have children, it is very important to eliminate and reduce those costs associated, and it has been mentioned by a number of other panelists, costs for, for a uh, monthly cost for birth control pills or an IUD or other long-acting contraceptives, if we can eliminate those barriers, then we can really advance the health of both men and women in this country. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Brindis. Next, we have Dr. Cynthia Gomez, who is the founding director of the Health Equity Institute. She previously served as co-director of the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies at UCSF and has been a leading scientist in HIV prevention research since 1991. Her work is focused primarily on gender, culture, and sexual health, on the development of prevention interventions, and on the translation of science to community practice. Please welcome Dr. Gomez. Good afternoon. You're being very patient. Thank you. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that it's really appropriate that we're having this discussion here today at, at this university that was founded in 1899 as a teacher training college for women. And where in 1968, the students, the faculty, the staff stood up and said, no more. We organized and led a series of actions to protest the systematic discrimination, lack of access, misrepresentation of histories and cultures and knowledge of indigenous people and people of color. We founded the first and now the only College of Ethnic Studies in the United States. This is a place from which our students see, can see when something's coming down the road that is not right and demands that it not happen again. And in this campus, I know that we will not tolerate another wave of misrepresentation of histories, of cultures, and of knowledge. We are dedicated here to equity and social justice. And if we have to start the movement, we'll start the movement, right? I know we will. I want to get you out of the weeds a little bit because what is happening is this continuous attack on several fronts that have to do with women's health. And it makes us move constantly. We have to stop this one. We have to stop that one. We have to stop this other one. And this, uh, this rhetoric, or as my colleague, Dr. Emily Mann, who's looking at discourse, looks at what is really happening what is happening is that we are being influenced by a certain p discourse and rhetoric that eventually people start to believe. And today, that rhetoric is that women have no rights. How do we get there? You've heard a lot of the historical memories for those of us who have been around a little longer um, about how we thought we had fought that battle. And yet there are extreme radical ideologies emerging that are taking us back to a time when women and poor people were proprietary. They were a property of a few. And the decisions that are being made, uh, being made supposedly on our behalf are to take all of those rights and liberties away. We have to see that. Don't get blinded by all of the little things, see the big picture, and take action. Last year, when we initiated Healthy People 2020, which is a long-standing way in which our governments and our public health systems try to address the health of our society, we made a radical change. For the first time, we left the medical model, and we said social determinants of health are key in determining one's health status and outcomes. So the fact that I might live in a neighborhood that doesn't have any kind of access to reproductive health is a social determinant of my health because it is a barrier that I must overcome to seek preventative services, to seek contraceptive services. Or if I am not allowed to get an education, if you were not allowed into this university, thankful we have an opportunity for you to do this, you would not have the opportunity to learn in a way that gives you a perspective that you otherwise do not have. And, and then you are influenced even more. So social determinants of health are critical, and yet the current attempt is to actually add additional social barriers for women. And we have to focus on eliminating those. The Health Equity Institute here at San Francisco State is focused on just that. Because we really believe that if we address 
and eliminate these barriers and these policies, that we are, are really creating an opportunity for equal opportunity for health for all. I'm going to end by saying that no matter where you stand in your moral compass, nobody's asking you to believe a certain way or another way, is that there are certain things that we must be clearly concerned about, and that is the erosion of the division of church and state in our federal government in the United States. We have candidates even questioning whether such a divide should exist. And so we must agree. Do we want government to determine our religion? I don't want my government to tell me who my God is. I don't think that is something we fought for before. Nor do we want religion to dictate how we govern. If you have a religious belief that has you making certain decisions, you do that in the privacy of your church, of your home, and of your bedroom. But the government should not be dictating this. And yet, they're deciding on women's reproductive rights. We must retain both our religious freedom and our civil liberties. And um, I mentioned this a little bit. I'll mention it again. Our U.S. motto changed in 1956 to, in God we trust. And many people use that to demonstrate that we are a religious um, country. And yet it was done to actually, you know, fight against the uh, uh, view of communism as atheist, and therefore we were not communist. Um, but really our original motto uh, that our, our United States was founded on is e pluribus unum, out of many one. And it really should represent that we are going to come together and not allow the few to tell us what our rights are as women and as human beings. Thank you. Now, I've got to tell you, I go to lots of events on women's issues, and this panel is hot. I <laughs> just want you all to know that. And we're going to end now um, with Dr. Carrie Frederick, who earned her MD and MPH at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, who did her residency at Stanford, who is now a second-year fellow in family planning at Stanford. She comes from a family of activists, and that is why she is so passionate on reproductive rights. She has particular interest in insurance coverage for contraception and abortion, and in the intersection of law and medicine as it pertains to reproductive rights. She's speaking today on behalf of Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health, a national physician advocacy group committed to using scientific evidence to promote sound women's health policy. Welcome. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I just want to start by saying that I am thrilled to be up here on a panel organized by a legislator talking about contraception that's full of women. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to see the House panel uh, last month, and there will be no ham sandwich defense today. Um, so now that you've had the chance to hear from our fantastic panelists about why broader access to contraception is so important, I want to tell you a little bit about an experience that I've had that will hopefully inspire you to get involved in this issue. As part of my work with Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health, I had the opportunity to go to Capitol Hill last November to speak with legislators on the issue of insurance coverage for contraception. This was back when the bishops had just met with the Obama administration, and the administration was considering how broad to make the religious exemption to the contraceptive coverage mandate. This was my first serious lobbying experience, and at that time, speaking with several of our California legislators and their staff, I remember being pleasantly surprised at their enthusiasm and commitment to this issue. I was grateful that they were all so clearly on our side, and honestly, I became a little complacent. Mm -hmm. In February, amidst the uproar after the administration announced its decision not to broaden the exemption, I had the opportunity to do further lobbying in support of the decision, and when the accommodation was announced, 
I called our legislators to thank them for fighting for us. Something happened that day that really stuck with me. When I called one legislator's office to express my thanks, the aide who answered the phone said she would pass my message along to the senator as she liked to know about outliers. I thanked her and hung up the phone, and then it hit me what she had said. <laughs> Outlier? I was shocked and a bit ashamed because I know that I was speaking for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Californians when I called that day but she thought I was in a small minority. It hit me then that those of us on the pro-choice side need to reach out to our pro-choice legislators instead of taking them for granted. One of the biggest things I've learned since I've been doing advocacy work, and particularly with regard to contraception and choice, is that we need to express our agreement and support just as much as we need to speak out when we disagree with something. Our legislators need to hear when we support them, and we need to thank them for a job well done. We're so fortunate in California to have people like Congresswoman Spear and Barbara Boxer who we can count on to do the right thing, no matter if we don't call. But not everyone has such courage to stand up for reproductive rights. Furthermore, when it comes to the issue of abortion, and now unbelievably even access to contraception, we must speak up and inform those who are fighting on our behalf of where we stand. Those who want to limit access to abortion and contraception feel so morally justified, they don't hesitate to speak their minds. I can guarantee you that in February, our legislators' offices were inundated with calls from these people outraged about the administration's decision. What I've seen in the past few months, however, through the contraceptive coverage mandate and the Komen versus Planned Parenthood debacle, is that we too have found our voices. We too feel righteous in our belief that women deserve access to contraception as fundamental health care. We know in our hearts that women deserve privacy and respect when facing an unplanned or problem pregnancy. We are not outliers, but those who represent us don't know we're out here unless we tell them. So what I want you to know is that it's so easy to call your legislator's office or pay them a visit. You can follow them on Twitter or Facebook or send them an email. I want you to learn from my experience that when you call or write or tweet, they hear you and your opinion matters. I would bet that even though some of the students in here today are not even old enough to vote, Congresswoman Spear and her colleagues would still love to hear from you, hear your stories, and know how legislation like the Affordable Care Act impacts your lives. You can also write a letter to the editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, like I did recently, or the New York Times, or the Wall Street Journal, or USA Today, among others. During recent testimony in the House, Connecticut Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro shared the story of a patient that my colleague, Dr. Lori Garron, had written about in a letter to the editor, personalizing the importance of access to contraception. If you've got a story, it could be you that Congresswoman Spear is talking about next. If you're passionate about this issue, I want you to feel empowered to speak up. Talk to your friends and family, blog, tweet, call, attend a state or national lobby day, or go to perch.org and sign up for advocacy alerts. Um, whatever you feel you're capable of doing. I let fear and intimidation keep me quiet for way too long, and my experience the past few months has shown me that it was so much easier and so much more fun than I ever expected. Your voices are important and valued, and I encourage you to use them. Don't let us ever be called outliers again. Thank you. Now we have some roving mics, so if you have any questions of any of the panelists, um, we're ready to answer them. Any questions? Raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. Questions? 
question right here. Hi, um, this is Aisha. I'm a San Francisco State uh, student here um, at the university. And um, this is actually for all of you. So whoever wants to answer, take a shot at it, go for it. OK, so I think that the issues discussed here today can fall very well fall under world issues as well for women. And which is why, I mean, especially for underdeveloped nations where women don't even have the knowledge of what family planning is and what contraceptives are. So I want to ask your, um, if any, if you guys have a standpoint or a viewpoint about this issue, um, you know, I would love to know about it and if there's anything being done regarding um, going across borders and talking to women who don't have such luxuries as all of us do here today. So, yeah. This is Jean Conry. You're right. I, there was a, a great lecture that we heard last year that said it's the equivalent of two jumbo jet, jets crashing every day um, of women, filled with women, when we look at maternal mortality. So I know f nationally for the OBGYN Society, we put global women's health a top priority and are working with the State Department to really expand and educate and work with the providers across the, the world. Anyone else? Sure. You know, I'll add, uh, as you heard before, I work a lot in HIV, and this is a huge, huge issue globally in terms of reproductive uh, knowledge, education, and health around the world. And we recognize that until women around the world are given the knowledge and the tools, that their power, and, and we talk a lot about power for women globally, is really undermined because they cannot control the reproduction. And there's expectations that they uh, have an obligation. And so I think that it's been very clear that the efforts now are to educate young women around the world mm -hmm. because we believe that education will help women uh, really become empowered enough to fight. And again, we didn't think that we'd be doing our own fight here, um, but it, it is a global movement, and I think that you'll find that there are many women who are linked around the world for the, you know fighting for our rights. Yeah, so let me just add one other comment. I think interestingly that at the global level, the, at the United Nations, the World Health Organization. There is a keen appreciation that a dollar invested in the improvement not only of women's health, but women's education and women's economic ability helps to transform societies and nations and really raises their um, development and their economy in a way that can't be accomplished through any other investment. Uh, in some ways, I almost feel like there's a greater appreciation of that as people are looking, so the thoughtful people looking strategically about uh, improving things worldwide than in this country. And we need to apply that same thing here or the clock will be turned back. Other questions? Hi, I'm Laura Mamo, professor here at State. Thank you for this wonderful expert panel. My question uh, today really has to do with the move to the right of our um, current political process and not just the rhetoric that we hear um, about sort of this assault on, on women's rights and women's issues, but also the, the control of the policies that are being put forward um, and that what can, the question is really for you, uh, Congresswoman Spear, but what can we kind of do to fight the constant push of these policies that we, you ha we have to address and maneuver and sort of dance our, dance to make sure don't get passed? Um, how can we help you? Good question. The 73 Republican members that were elected in 2010 that gave the Republicans the majority in the House have had a profound effect on politics in Washington and on this extreme move to the right. Uh, so much so that Speaker Bain or even in trying to negotiate a, a solution to the debt limit being lifted found himself going back to his caucus and being told, no, we are not going to support it. And it really has had a, a crippling effect on our ability to do something not just with women's health issues, but on some economic issues that are truly profound. So 
I think that what needs to happen is for the American people to recognize extremism, no matter where it is, is counterproductive to our country maintaining its global position and um, our economic status uh, generally. And I would just encourage you to talk to your friends across the country um, to speak out and vote heartily, not often, but <laughs> heartily, um, for those that reflect, I think, a, a move to make sure that, that government is going to bring the, the best out in the American people, not the worst. A student at SF State graduating. Can you today. stand up and hold okay. that mic a little closer to your yes, mouth? You. Okay. Um, I have a question um, regarding. I see a lot um, online. A lot of opposition really comes from ignorance. So, um, where, when you know we are tweeting or blogging or I'm going to post a Facebook status, um, where can we really send people to educate them about this issue? Good question. All right, ladies. <laughs> You know, I think it, it has to do with some of the web sources that you're looking at here. For sure, sure I fully um, support ACOG and what we do. Planned Parenthood, I know, has a very powerful website. In California, our state government put together a great site called Every Woman California. There's a lot of information there. So those are, are reputable sites that I would go to? I, oh, sorry. I was going to say, in addition, both Cynthia and I serve on the Goodmocker board, and also the Bixby Center has a number of reports that are California-focused, as well as groups like Advocates for Youth. So I really encourage you to be the translator of those uh, websites, because you know how to couch the facts into those facts that are most meaningful to the people you know, surrounding you and, um, and that you're interacting with. I'll, I'll just echo that, uh, particularly on Goodmarker, you can download slide sets, I mean, just all kinds of materials, clips, um, and forward those along, and um, they're really great, and, and sometimes uh, very much in social media snippets. One last uh, source is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that also have has tremendous information available, also PowerPoints available, and they have a whole area of preconceptual and interconceptual care that's also extremely important, as well as the Healthy People 2020 and the Healthy People 2010. Tracy, did you have? Yeah, and I would make a plug for RH Reality Check, which yes. is the online magazine that's, that's daily, that it co covers all of these issues if you're interested in sort of a topical journal um, on specifically on these issues. Let me also add this one point. I tweet and Facebook, and I kind of read what's being said and sometimes someone will attack me and then I'll watch the debate that goes on among uh, tweeters and it's very edifying. So I hope that, that when you see things you don't like that, that you speak out. Don't just say, oh, that's you know, hogwash and let it go. I mean, be counted. Be counted with your voices um, whenever you're in that setting and have that opportunity. We're going to have to bring this uh, forum to a close. Thank you all very much for, for being here and for participating. And thank you to our panelists and to our student panelists as well. You were so great. I wish I could bring you all to DC. You were so terrific. Maybe we can, have, can we have a picture of the yes. five? Can we have, thank you. Can we have a photo? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank Sure. We're going to take a picture of all the panelists and then we'll take one with you, okay? <laughs>